um, for those of you who are just joining us, I'm Dan Masmanian, director of the USC Bedrosian Center on Governance, and, and we're pleased to be co-hosting this, I think, historically important symposium, this retrospective on presidential leadership and the presidency of, of Ronald Reagan. Uh, we now turn to the third of our four symposium panels to the issue of policy leadership, and especially the link between the president and Congress in developing public policy. Our moderator is Professor and Dean of the U.S. School of Policy Planning and Development, and none other than Jack Knott, holder of the C. Irwin and Iron, Iron, Iron I'm sorry, L. Piper Dean's Chair. Um, first, a word about Jack, who in turn will be introducing the panelists. In addition to leading our school to new heights over the past five years, Jack is a leading scholar with numerous publications in the fields of public management and political institutions. He brings to the discussion today both his academic perspective and personal and professional insights about policymaking, reaching from the Reagan presidency to the president. Thus, I think he is aptly suited not only to be moderator, but contributor to the discussion. And uh, uh, Jack, I want to thank you for leading the panel, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Just one announcement, which is we've both been asked several times about the papers. And I just wanted everybody to know that the, the, uh, the format here has been to ask the panelists to bring papers and share them with the panelists as drafts. So we, did not make, we have not made the full papers available, but we will be doing so over the course of the coming weeks and possibly even months as they are completed. Everybody who's registered will be contacted because we have your emails and we intend to do so to let you know when the papers are available. We will be doing that. So, Jack, the panel's to you. Uh, I sh uh, should also mention that um, this is being video recorded and uh, will be up in a week or so on our YouTube site. So uh, it'll be SPPD's YouTube site, so if you uh, really are uh, feeling nostalgic about wanting to see one of these panels again, <laughs> you can do so on, on YouTube. And part of it will also be uh, on C-SPAN. They are not doing the whole thing, but they'll take some clips from it. Well, good morning, everyone. I um, really welcome you to our panel focusing on policy, leadership, and uh, legislative relations under President Reagan. Uh, every president seeks to uh, implement a policy agenda for the country. And in the United States, that's particularly challenging because unlike a parliamentary system uh, where the prime minister is also the leader of the parliament as well as uh, the head of the country, in the United States, we elect a separate, uh, per, uh, we separately elect the president from the two houses of Congress. Uh, and so in order to pass legislation, it often requires uh, a serious negotiation, uh, persuasion, lobbying effort between the president uh, and the Congress in order to get legislation passed. So this dynamic is especially important in the United States. Uh, I wanted to mention that presidents have taken very uh, different approaches to this. and often in their first efforts are not very successful. People who uh, have been very successful at governor, uh, somebody like uh, President Clinton, for example, came in and uh, had a terrible time trying to deal with the, the Congress. Carter, the same way, uh, you know, was a successful governor in Georgia, but didn't know how to deal with this relationship. So this relationship is exceeding, exceedingly important. Sometimes presidents have also sought to get around uh, having to deal with Congress in order to get their policy agenda set uh, by uh, using regulations, executive order, uh, rules that they have the power over, appointment uh, power. So we're going to look at that in this panel as well, not just dealing uh, with the legislature, but also some of the efforts uh, by the White House to uh, influence appointments and, and uh, uh, regulations and rules as well. And in addition, the president, uh, as was mentioned in the last power, uh, panel, plays a very important role on the bully pulpit or as a, a, a rhetorical leader for the country. And so interest groups and public opinion play a very important role in this as, as well as a leverage that the president can use almost more importantly than almost any other actor in this 
struggle uh, often or at least uh, relationship with the Congress in trying to get uh, his or her policy agenda adopted. Uh, in the case of Reagan, uh, I happen to, uh, people uh, find this uh, surprising sometimes, but I was at the Reagan Library last fall for the Reagan lecture and it was given by Chris Matthews. And uh, people say, Chris Matthews. Uh, well, it turns out that uh, Chris Matthews was the chief of staff for Tip O'Neill uh, when President Reagan was president and uh, sat in on all of the uh, personal rela meetings that uh, Tip O'Neill had with President Reagan and so had a real keen insight into that relationship. And um, Reagan, as we know uh, from the last panel and uh, from our general knowledge of him, uh, was a master at creating interpersonal relationships with people and using humor and, and, a, and, a, and a very warm uh, personality in order to establish those relationships. And Chris Matthew told the story of how uh, the first person Reagan wanted to meet with when he became president was uh, Tip O'Neill. And his staff advised against it. No, the, the, you guys are very opposite. You, you shouldn't start out your presidency that way. Tip O'Neill staff and Chris Matthews said the same thing. We don't advise that you meet with the president in a personal meeting. You know, we have to arrange this. But the president was insistent. President Reagan insisted the first person he wanted to meet with. So they arranged it in the Oval Office. He sat on one end of the couch. Tip O'Neill came in and sat on the other end of the couch. And the two staffs, as Chris Matthews says, were nervous as could be that this was going to uh, you know, devolve into some kind of shouting match and be a terrible embarrassment. But uh, Reagan sat down, looked very relaxed, got a big smile on his face, and said, uh, hey, Tip, uh, I've got a great Irish joke for you. <laughs> and uh, he told this joke, and uh, everybody laughed, and uh, then Tip said, you think that's a good Irish joke? Listen to this one. And so Tip told him... <laughs> Uh, Irish joke back, and within about five minutes, they had moved to the center of the couch and uh, were engaged in conversation. And uh, that established a relationship that lasted throughout uh, that uh, period of time when Reagan was president. And indeed, the very first non-faculty member, non-faculty, uh, <laughs> non-family member, uh, my faculty is my family. Maybe that's why I'm <laughs> mixing that up. The fir very first non a uh, family member that Reagan invited into his hospital room uh, at, after he had been shot was Tip O'Neill. So uh, that was a very close uh, relationship that they had. So uh, we're going to be looking at uh, not only uh, Reagan's uh, 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 strategies and approach to policy making uh, in dealing with the Congress and dealing with other agencies, et cetera, uh, but we want to talk about this element of leadership in general and place President Reagan in a context of comparing with some other presidents as well so we kind of understand his approach and how successful he was or not uh, relative to some other uh, presidents. And uh, we're going to begin uh, with a presentation uh, by Matthew Beckman. Uh, Matthew is an associate professor of political science at the University of California, Irvine. And uh, he has uh, done extensive studies of the presidency of Washington politics uh, and of uh, the policy making process. And I think you'll be uh, impressed by the kind of data that he's put together comparing uh, Reagan with uh, some of the other presidents from Eisenhower all the way to Obama. Uh, he's also a faculty member at the UC Irvine Center for the Study of Democracy and uh, is a prominent uh, political scientist looking at democratic institutions. Uh, his research includes the Congress, the presidency, interest groups, mass media, and uh, politics. So what we're going to do is, uh, Matt is gonna come up, give his presentation. Uh, unfortunately, this uh, beautiful screen we have of uh, the Reagan Centennial prevents us from dropping uh, the screen from above. So we had to set it up this way. So Matt will come up, give his presentation, uh, 15, 20 minutes or so, and then after that, we'll assemble the panel, and I'll in introduce the other panel members. Matt? Thank you. Well, first off, like, thank you so much for including me in this. I, I when Dan first approached me uh, several months ago about coming and doing this, I, I was 
we've got three little kids, I'm really busy, I'm not sure I'm the right person for this. But just hearing what, what um, everyone was putting together was so exciting that I was humbled to be included, so I, I really appreciate the opportunity, Jack and Dan. Um, unlike my predecessors up on the stage, I'm not as eloquent as everyone else, and so I lean on a crutch, which is, I, I also just, I think in terms of pictures and data and stuff, and so I will go through, I just work best with slides and talking through that. And so I can see them up here and you can see them over there and I'll just sort of work through thinking about the broader dynamics of presidential congressional interactions and we're focusing on President Reagan's legislative touch. Um, so here he is with uh, the speaker, Tip O'Neill, and hearing Jack's stories reminded me of the famous quip that I had always heard was, that they, they would say we could be adversaries during the work day, but come five o'clock we could sit down and have a drink together. And so starting at five o'clock we became friends and Reagan would call Tip O'Neill and say, hey Tip, can't we, it's two o'clock, but can't we fake like it's five o'clock, come on over. <laughs> and so they did have this sort of unique uh, relationship, but oftentimes when we hear the stories of Reagan's dealings with Congress, and in particular with Tip O'Neill, we overestimate the sense of which their interpersonal uh, linkage and friendship and their, their, their sort of general goodwill with each other as people, we overstate how much that led to them cutting deals on policy, that they were adversaries on policy. They disagreed in very fundamental ways on important policies facing the country. And so it wasn't like either one of them gave in. They went in there and they worked hard to forge an agreement uh, based on principles and not so much based on friendship. And so when we think of the 1981 tax cut, which still stands out as an exempt, when political scientists as well as historians, journalists, and, and when I did interviews on Capitol Hill, 1981 frequently gets flagged as like, this is the exemplar of what presidential power can be. It's, this is what the potential and practice of presidential leadership is. A president pushing an ambitious agenda before an antagonistic Congress and doing so to great effect. So. It, when, so I thought I would sort of start talking through a little, just briefly, the story of 1981 tax cut. But when it starts, they start with a lot of bipartisan uh, discussions. And Ross Dinkowski, who's here uh, next to Tip O'Neill, uh, Ross Dinkowski was chair of the Ways and Means Committee. They're sitting around with the Reagan administration and they're meeting quite often and trying to see, is there a way we can do this in a bipartisan way, this tax, this, uh, ta what turned into the 81 tax cut. And they're going back and forth, and eventually the Democrats, as you recall, like the economy is struggling in 81, and Reagan's numbers are coming down. Uh, and his, so his approval rating and a lot of the sort of fanfare that he came into office with in January 20th ha is dissipating pretty quickly as, as time unfolds. And so the Democrats start sensing, like, maybe he's a little weaker than we envision. Maybe we can actually not just cut a deal, but we can actually fight him. And so the more the negotiation go on, both sides have this meeting where in it, uh, Reagan tells, the, tells Rostenkowski and Tip O'Neill, fellas, we want you, but if, you're not, if you won't come, we're going another way. And at, at the end of that meeting, as they're walking out, um, Reagan turns to Treasury Secretary, then Treasury Tech Secretary Reagan and says, uh, I think we can get these swing voters uh, looking at Congress. And uh, sure enough, he s proceeds to do that and really embarks on a very aggressive appeal to forge a winning coalition among what were called the bull weevils, right? The sort of southern moderate Democrats. And so he has a bunch of them up to C Camp David and you read accounts of th this meeting in Camp David and uh, Ronald Reagan, typically Ronald Reagan, sort of says, well, they have this beautiful breakfast overlooking sort of the hills of Maryland from Camp David and doing all this stuff. And eventually Reagan says, well, now it's time for the sales pitch. And he starts talking to all these moderates about why they should support his tax cut rather than the alternative, which the Democrats are working on, flies back to Washington and gave this famous Oval Office address at right on the e a couple days before the big votes on the tax cut in the House, where he points out to this graph, and I, I don't know how well it comes up for you, I can't really see what you guys see, but um, it sort of says, there, there's the two lines and the red in between. It's like, here's taxes under their bill, and it literally says their bill, <laughs> and here's taxes under our bill. And he did like Reagan does, right? He just sort of talked in a very uh, affable, friendly way, like a friend talking to another friend of, here is what I'm proposing to do, and here's what the Democrats are proposing to do. 
And he very starkly said, we're going to reach this fork, uh, this fork in the road, and we have to pick one of two paths, my path or the Democratic path. And of course, they picked his. <laughs> uh, I should say, I quote in here, this, uh, this was the headline on the Washington Post the next day, that after Reagan gave the speech, and one of the things Lou Cannon in his book re uh, refers to is how uh, one of the things Reagan had honed over time was his ability to anticipate how an audience would react to his uh, speeches, appeals, whatever. And so I, you can only imagine as he's leaving the Oval Office and walking back to the White House residence how he must have felt after the speech because it was a home run in the sense that it animated people to call their congressman. <laughs> and so when you read the story that goes along with this, it's sort of like all these moderate Democrats are being besieged by all their, vote, their, their constituents, saying like, well, you need to support the one that says his bill, <laughs> not their bill. And, um, and so it just lit up the whole Capitol switchboard. In fact, they were struggling to keep, keep not disconnecting all the calls. So it was sort of this famous moment, and when a couple days later they went to vote, they supported President Reagan. And so uh, the, here he is up at, in Santa Barbara, up the, up the road here a little ways, signing the, the Economic Recovery Tax Act of 81 into law. And you can see, you know, it's sort of a foggy morning, but he obviously is radiant as he's signing this. And it, when you read the signing statement that he offered at the time, you can tell it's like a massive win, which it, it was, as the New York Times reported. With stunning victories today, the president has won congressional approval for the largest budget and tax cuts in modern American history, changes that his partisans have termed the Reagan Revolution, inviting comparisons to the early New Deal period of Franklin D. Roosevelt. Uh, Inside, as I say, when I'm up on, when I have been inside the White House and on Capitol Hill, this is, they flag this as the example of what the presidency can do, how great a president can be. And when we think of what can a president do to affect change, 1981 is a, is a place where practitioners tend to look and say that, that was a moment. Inside uh, academia, it's less clear. There, it, we tend to struggle more with thinking about exactly what was the president's impact. And when you start accounting for the various other things that are at play at any given time, uh, it becomes less obvious that, any, that the president mattered a ton. So it's not that we say no, but there tends to be more questions about how much of credit does the context get, how much credit does President Reagan get. I think uh, what I'm going to kind of go through today and say is it's hard to study any particular case and, and really know why that's true. And, or it's hard, to, you can't study any case in isolation and really make any firm conclusions. The way to study things is sort of to get a distribution and, and be able to compare things. So that's what I want to do today. So the, here, just to give you a sense of why academics tend to be more skeptical about claims of great presidential power in any particular case, including the 81 tax cut, is here is Congressional Quarterly flags all the votes that presidents take a position on and then say whether or not they win or lose on those votes. And so here is presidents during the, the, all the roll call votes that presidents took positions on in their first year and sort of lined up from, as you see, Obama did super well in his first year in office in terms of like he almost, it was rarely the case that he ever took a position that didn't prevail in Congress. Uh, not surprisingly given the uh, composition of Congress at the time and sort of how he used his, he was very selective about what it was he would support. And, and LBJ is up at the top down there. And then you see uh, Bush and Nixon, Bush 40, the dad, HW, at the bottom. And Reagan is somewhere in the middle. And so this is sort of gives you a sense of why, in general, presidents do really well in their first year on big votes. And part of the story that we tell is this is, a, you know, they come in on the eve of having campaigned on an ambitious agenda, and this is a moment when they can do it. And so a lot of it is the context more than the president. And you see Reagan is somewhere in the middle of this distribution. And here is his support on roll call votes going forward for the rest of the years of his uh, administration. And so here what you see again is like he, he did well in his first year, but then the tide slowly starts rolling out. And so again, it, you know, if we were to say, oh, President Reagan really had these magic keys to influencing Congress, it becomes less co compelling. Why would he know it in 81 and not know it in 88? You know, what, what was it that he lost? Or did, and so that is why we have political scientists have tried to step back and sort of situate things in a broader context of other presidents, other moments, other, other opportunities. So I was going to try to situate Re President Reagan in context, talk about what do presidents do beyond their context. They aren't just passive observers to congressional whim. Uh, 
uh, and then look about what Reagan actually did and how he did, I think, make a difference. And then I'll draw some of the broader lessons about what, what presidents do or don't do. So this is wholly unfair, I think, and especially like as I look out, I've got all these august colleagues sitting before me, but I'm, I don't, I'm forging ahead. Uh, I'm gonna oversimplify what the scholarly literature view is uh, at, the, at the danger of doing so, sort of overly, overly stylizing it. But I think in general, if you look back at the, a lot of the earlier generation of presidency scholars, it, through, through the 60s, coming on the eve of FDR and in particular, as well as LBJ, there was the sense that presidents, the presidency provided awesome powers and that presidents could do all sorts of things. And when uh, people of that era looked back and tried to understand what is it that explains when presidents succeed or fail, they tended to study the president himself and they would look at his particular character. Uh, was he positive and optimistic? Was he negative and pessimistic? Was he active or was he passive? Was, these types of character traits. And so I think the, when you kind of lump that uh, literature together, you, can, you go back to Woodrow Wilson's thesis, which said, the president is at liberty, both in law and conscience, to be as big a man as he can. The idea is presidential success depends heavily on the president, the particulars of the president, who he is, what he believes. Um, then as people, as a subsequent group of scholars really revisited the question and brought to bear more systematic evidence, uh, it, it seemed like presidents mattered very little. And so it, it sort of always reminds me of LBJ's sort of funny reflections, which obviously he didn't believe either, but uh, being president is like being a jackass in a hailstorm. There's nothing to do but stand there and take it. You can see this in all sorts of, I, I, could, if, I could bore you to tears with quotations like this where presidents reflect on the helplessness with which they thought, you know, John Kennedy, said when he was in the, in the Senate looking up, looking down at Pennsylvania Avenue at the White House, he always thought, wow, that's where the real power is. That's an awesome building. And then when he got to the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue and looked back up at Congress, he thought, wow, that's where the real power is. That's where things really get done. Uh, so just to situate Reagan, when, when academics, including some of the ones sitting before me, have studied this, and, and I'm drawing on their work in doing this, They've identified, what are, when we talk about context, what the heck do we mean? It's not just an, some ambiguous, uh, amorphous context. It, there are specific things that we can turn to to say, here, are the, here is what sets the parameters on what presidents can achieve. So the first thing is the composition of Congress. It, it, if we were to talk about uh, presidential congressional interactions and a president's chances for affecting change, the first thing we would ask is, what's the composition of the Congress they happen to confront? It matters a ton. And so when we look at Reagan, I've put Reagan's four, uh, you know, e each congressional session term is two-year terms. Uh, and so he's got four, of Reagan's eight years included four congressional terms. And you see he's sort of, uh, when it comes to the Senate, a little better than average in terms of, he's got a little bit more of his own partisans in Congress than m many of the other uh, presidents who come into Washington. But in the House, he's at the decidedly unfavorable end of the spectrum. That, that is to say, he's facing a lot of Democrats. It's not quite as ominous as it seems, though, because as I said, there's a bunch of these bull weevils who are m very moderate, and, and it's sort of the legacy of the Southern Democrats as they're being slowly thrown out over time, sort of culminating in 94. But you see, even, even counting them, he's not in a, it's not like Obama currently. So if you look at the ones at the front of both of these, at, with the most favorable Congresses, it's LBJ, LBJ, JFK, Jimmy Carter, and at the bottom it's Eisenhower at the very end, Ford, Ford, Richard Nixon. So Democrats sort of advantage in the post-war period in Congress really shows up when we look at what are the opportunities, and that's true in both the House and Senate. The same people are at, at both ends of the spectrum. And so LBJ really did inherit a super favorable climate for pushing legislation as he enters on the 89th Congress in, in 1965. Reagan is somewhere in the middle, but beyond the particulars of the Congress and the congressional composition are just other variables that seem to matter when we are trying to explain presidential success in Congress. So you, presidents do tend to get a honeymoon at the start. That first year bump is pretty systematic. We see that quite often. Um, there's some evidence, though it's not as clear, that there's a lame duck period at the end where you become sort of less relevant as people start looking over your shoulder. You learn more and more about how to 
how to deal with Congress as you go over time. You learn more and more about pushing legislation. And polarization is real, that there is really good evidence that we have seen that the post-war period, sort of the 50s, were unique, and we're returning to a more typical polarized period where the Democrats and Republicans are not uh, overlapping. They're, in fact, they're at opposite ends, sort of staring at each other in, with suspicious eyes. Beyond the political context that presidents inherit, there is also a policy context. And so healthcare, pushing a healthcare, healthcare bill or an energy bill, it tends to be harder than pushing an education bill or a uh, tax bill in, in general, like on average. And what also matters is the sal some issues are really uh, salient and highly charged and people are paying attention. Other issues, nobody knows. So all of these sort of set the backdrop against which when a president comes in and says, here's what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna push hard, uh, that there's this backdrop by which we have to understand the backdrop to understand what they've done against that backdrop. So this, I, I'm, I'm not gonna bore you with the insides of my, this is my book. I'm not gonna bore you with how I did all this stuff, but I will bore you with what I say in it, <laughs> what I found in it. So the big thing is we went and got a big study of legislation in the post-war period. And so what I can do is sort of say, look, here is more systematically how, how do presidents matter, not in any particular case, but in a bunch of cases, across a bunch of different presidents, across a bunch of different contexts. Then we can start to ferret out how much is context and how much is president. So here, uh, you know, I can't help myself, I'm a Michigan PhD, but so I, I did this sort of multiple regression stuff, which you don't need to worry about, but what the upshot of it, when you calculate what are the chances Reagan would win a legislative victory in each of the Congresses if he doesn't get involved, if he sort of sits back and waits for the context to occasionally throw him a success, the answer is it's like not very often, right? It's sort of like one in 10, one in nine times, Every now and again, he's going to get a chance to sign a bill, but it's not going to happen very often. And what we see, which you know, all of us, especially in this room, know, is presidents don't just do that. They don't just sit back and sort of say, I'm not going to muddy myself in the legislative waters and, and try to... Uh, they jump right in, and they do so whether it's Gerald Ford or LBJ. Whether there's a good chance of success or not, presidents have advocated, articulated, and pushed for ambitious agendas in general. Uh, and so President Reagan didn't just stand there and take it, even though he faced a relatively sort of dicey situation for winning, just like other presidents haven't. Um, and so Reagan, you can go back, I mean, the speech in the Oval Office is the famous one, but he does a ton of contacting members one-on-one, -on -one, phone calls in groups. That They are actively pursuing their agenda and doing so very aggressively, uh, investing heavily in it. And so one of the things that my research team coded was, what role does the president play on these things? And we purposefully left the lobbied category pretty big to make it a conservative test of whether presidents can matter. We didn't pick just like, oh, there are the three that they really tried on. We, we cast a wider net. And what you see is President Reagan looks a lot like other presidents ex with a minor exception. He, so he plays no role. Here's the average of the other post-war presidents with Reagan sort of highlighted. And he plays no role about a third of the time. He endorses a position about a quarter of the time, and he gets actively involved about, uh, you know, 40% of the time. This is, what I think we see is he's being selective, but not super, he's selective in pushing, he picks specific issues that he's really gonna, he focuses his energies on his agenda. He doesn't do like Carter and throw out for everything. In fact, he says, here's what we're gonna do and here's what we're not gonna do. Uh, and so he's actively involved, and I think the reason why president, in general, I mentioned sort of the stand there and take it line, and that has always been a puzzle for political scientists, is like, if context matters as much as we think it does, why the heck do presidents do this? They could do other things. They could focus, dealing with Capitol Hill is a pain in the butt relative to the other things you could do, so why not go and do travel abroad or do fun things? Why do they invest so heavily in pushing legislation, domestic legislation particularly? And I think, so this is like my favorite table in the world which it probably won't be yours, but I, I don't care. I'm forging ahead. Um, in that what I did was sort of look at what happens when the president gets involved. So here is the, the proportion of bills that end in a law the president supports, given the involvement of the president. So like I'll just do Eisenhower to give you a sense of it. 15% of the bills that he plays no role in end in a, outcome, in a new law favorable to, in, in the direction of, that Eisenhower supported. 
uh, by contrast, 56% of the laws that he actually lobbied for ended in a, outcome, in a new law that he supported. And so you go down the line for each of the presidents, and that's, that's the basic story. And the last column tells you the difference between when they didn't lobby and when they did lobby. So let me make just a couple quick points about this. The first quick point is, notice as, I, as everyone, as political scientists really emphasize first and foremost, context matters a lot. Even when, um, so like LBJ, right, even when he does nothing, 63% of those bills end in laws that he supports. So he's winning three out of five times when he does nothing, doesn't lift a finger, doesn't deploy the infamous treatment. Uh, but he does better when he does. So the other thing is like, notice Reagan or Bush 41 or Bush 43, they aren't experiencing this sort of def just default success. That they're, if they are to achieve success, it's that they have to do something for it. So the first point is context matters a lot. It, it really matters a lot. And when we uh, grade presidents, we have to grade on a cur curve of the context which they inherit. But that's not to say presidents are helpless uh, hapless victims of, of context. They can do things, they, they do do things. And so when we look at the difference, we see that on average they do 30 points better when they lobby than when they don't. And President Reagan does a little better than average. In this audience I thought, of course, that I don't know, I mean, I, my hunch was, and I think this is great too, is you look at every president, generally the more involved they are, the greater they succeed, except for one exception, Jimmy Carter. I, when I, I, this is just one of these things like you sort of run, you, you gather the data, you really believe in it, and then you run it and see what happens. And I thought, you know, we always oversold how, ha, how sort of ham-handed Carter was at, and I thought we had overly told the story of his, but this just jumped off the page when I saw it and I laughed. And it, when I presented this one time, somebody reminded me of a study that um, one of our colleagues, Lee Siegelman, had done with his wife and that was called The Kiss of Death. And they had done experiments where they had Jimmy Carter, they gave an example of a policy position, and then they saw what people said about it, and then they did an exact same policy position, but they attributed it to Carter, and it got less support than the first one. And it, so I sort of laughed when I saw this. I'm like, man, the kiss of death extended from the public to Congress. Um, so I showed you earlier what the pr probability of winning if the president didn't get, if President Reagan didn't get involved with. Here it is if he does get involved. And what you see is it, legislative su success depended on Reagan. This is controlling all the other context. This is controlling for all the other things I've talked about. This is if President Reagan chose to get involved to actively invest himself in his administration and lobbying, his chances of winning went way up. And, and in fact, his winning did go way up as well, as I just showed. So some of the bills that we see pop out of this, I mean, the 81 tax cuts, of course, but uh, job training in 82, social security reform in 83, uh, tax reform in 86. I mean, that's really a remarkable success that, especially in the light of the context that is going on in 86, seems to depend a lot on sort of the coalition building between the Reagan administration and a couple of key leaders in Capitol Hill, um, as well as w welfare reform there at the end. So when my, you know, to sort of summarize or, or wrap up the broader lessons of what Reagan teaches us about presidential leadership, I think we, this is, this is like social psychologists have known this for a long time, right? When observers watch somebody in a particular setting, they way overestimate that individual's ability to affect the outcome. They tend to point to will and skill as determinative of whether or not somebody will win, succeed, prosper, whatever it is, across a broad, and nowhere is that more true than in the presidency, that we look at presidents and we, great, we see the president, we hear the president, and the context in which they're operating fades to the background and we tend not to see it. And so because the, and social psychologists, psychologists <coughs> refer to this as the fundamental attribution error, that we overestimate the individual at the expense of the context. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, I think that that's, you know, nowhere is that more true than when it comes to US presidents. And in particular, uh, when we think about presidents dealing with Congress, it's sort of like, no, Obama should try harder. Reagan did it right. It, we just tend to focus on the will and skill of the individual and not the particulars of the context. <coughs> Sorry, my little girl got me sick the other day. <coughs> um, and this is compounded when we think of anecdotes like 81, where, where we say, no, it really has happened in the past. <coughs> 
<clears throat> I think the lesson of 81, as well as generally Reagan, and what it shows us is it's not instructive because it says, oh, here is the magic formula for influencing Congress. There, is, there are no magic keys. There isn't a, if you do this, if you do that, you can do it. And it doesn't depend on the particular, it's not a personality trait. It, but what it shows is that uh, the trick for winning <coughs> in, on Capitol Hill, I'm sorry, I got it, thank you, Dan, um, is <coughs> presidents can make a difference. They, the, the, re the opportunity presented by the presidency as an office matters a lot. And so you have to do things which Reagan did do, which is prioritize your agenda carefully. You can't, you can't just do everything. You've got to focus your energies on specific sets of problems that you are going to invest heavily in. You've got to focus your lobbying efforts on those issues and on the right people at the right time. So on the, you've got to understand how Congress works and which leaders can you sit down with cut Tip O'Neill and cut a deal, or, or do you have to work around him and go for swing voters on the floor? Uh, those are, are decisions that staffers help advise presidents, and you need a good staff and a good president to have a feel for those things. And the final thing, which you've heard actually in several of the panels now, but principle and pragmatism. Reagan exemplified, you push on the principle, but you don't die on the principle. That is to say, uh, he, even Reagan, Lou Cannon quotes Reagan as saying something like, there are conservatives who really want us to go off the cliff with both flags flying. I don't want to go off the cliff. He would push hard for the principles he believed in, and not without abandoning those principles, he would still be very willing to cut a deal and figure out how can we compromise to the point that's pragmatic. I want to get things done. I don't want to just stand for things that I believe in. And so I think that really is true of presence. As good as it feels to stand on principle, uh, it's sometimes counterproductive. So I would close with uh, this quotation from Dwight Eisenhower that I just love which is, uh, I'll tell you what leadership is. It's persuasion and conciliation and education and patience. It's long, slow, tough work. I think that's right. And that's part of what 81, part of what the Reagan administration shows is there, it's not a personality trait that you can just take for granted. Oh, he connects or he does that. It's work. Leadership is work. And Reagan and his administration, his team, worked hard at promoting their legislation on Capitol Hill. And I and I would argue to good effect that, like a lot of other presidents, it actually made a difference. So that would be where I leave it. I think we're going to have the screen uh, taken away. And then when the screen's uh, gone, could we have the panelists come up then? And uh, Matt, you should also join the panelists. Thank you very much. You want me to sit next to Matt? Oh, sorry. <laughs> See a little bit of ingenuity here. Oh, okay. Well, I wanted to um, thank Matt for uh, a very insightful uh, presentation. I thought uh, his presentation in particular summarized in a very succinct way a lot of uh, research in political science that is focused on the presidency. And as he pointed out, it started out more with personality than when it's all institutions and now an interplay between the two. And, uh, I think that's a, a, a very important story. Uh, I also uh, really appreciated his, br his bringing to bear uh, the kind of data and analysis that he has so that we can see the elements of the way that presidents go about influencing the agenda and how, relative successful, how relatively successful they are to that context in which they operate. Uh, it looks like we're getting all set, so I'm going to uh, introduce the panel. Um, in addition to Matt, we have George Edwards. Uh, he is the Distinguished Professor of Political Science at Texas A&M University, sitting next to Matt. Uh, George is a leading scholar of the presidency. He's authored and edited dozens of articles and books on, the Ameri on American politics and policymaking, and 
as well. He has uh, spent a great deal of time consulting with governments, so not just writing about it, but he's advised Brazil and its constitution and operation of its presidency. He's uh, advised Russia on building a democratic national party system and Taylor Mexico on elections. <laughs> Uh, and Chinese scholars on democracy. So uh, he goes back and forth uh, between the academic world and a world of working with real leaders uh, in helping them make their co countries and institutions more democratic. Uh, next to George is Karen Holt. Uh, she is a professor and director of graduate studies at Virginia Tech University. Her research and teaching focuses on the U.S. presidency and executive branch bureaucracy as well as the U.S. judiciary. She has received research grants from the National Science Foundation, the National Endowment for Humanities, and the Gerald R. Ford Foundation, among others. And she's a core faculty member of Virginia Tech's Center for Public Administration and Policy. And next to Karen is Jim Perry. Uh, he's the Chancellor's Professor at Indiana University School of Public and Environmental Affairs. He's a prolific author. Uh, Jim has held faculty positions at UC Irvine, Chinese University of Hong Kong, University of Wisconsin, Madison, and uh, Yonsei uh, University in Korea. Uh, his recent research focuses on public service, motivation, community and national service, and uh, government reform. Uh, I've uh, known Jim for many years, uh, starting, uh, gosh, it must be, what was it, 30 years ago uh, at UC Irvine. Uh, so I'm pleased uh, Jim can join this panel and all the rest. So I'm gonna turn first to George, uh, if we could give a uh, five to 10 minute uh, reaction uh, to Matt's presentation uh, before we open it up for our discussion, thanks. Thanks very much, Jack. I'm delighted to be here and I'm particularly impressed that uh, you're having a, uh, a serious discussion about an important president, a high impact president, uh, rather than a hagiography, hey, you're having actually a sensible and civil discussion, so I congratulate you on that. And of course, I'm delighted to be on a panel uh, of distinguished people. And as someone who's been doing this uh, for almost four decades since I left graduate school, it's a delight to see a new and emerging uh, excellent uh, scholar give a, a very fine presentation to you. And I'm gonna try to pick up on a couple of his broad themes and apply them to the Reagan administration. One of his themes is context. And the way I look at this is <clears throat> that there are certain things presidents can't do, and what they can't do is create opportunities. What they can do is exploit opportunities. So let me try to illustrate the point, and I think this is absolutely fundamental about understanding leadership. We have some very exaggerated notions of leadership out there. You can go and take lessons about being a transformational leader. Uh, and I would argue to you that Presidents don't transform, uh, they facilitate, and sometimes they transform the world, but not through transformational leadership. What do I mean by that? And particularly about Ronald Reagan. We've heard a lot about Ronald Reagan's uh, rhetoric, <clears throat> and it's really, really interesting to study Ronald Reagan's rhetoric. A very common notion of presidential strategy in America it's not very, not very difficult to understand is you take your case to the public, you get the public on your side. When the public's on your side, Congress will respond. So, in effect, it's governing by campaigning. Very, very common. Presidents always do it, it seems, or with maybe the exception of George H.W. Bush, uh, they try quite commonly. And they almost always fail. And that's the important lesson here. They almost always fail. We heard about the 1981 speech. It never happened. There was never a response like that again. There has never been a response like that again. And if you went back 30 years before that, there never had been a response like that. Now, that's very impressive. And at the same time, public opinion actually didn't move. But the president was able to mobilize his supporters. That's a really good thing. That's smart. That's very, that's, that's very effective. But we need to understand. Ronald Reagan was a great communicator. That was the sobriquet. If you read Michael Deaver's two uh, books of memoirs, he talks about, sometimes he crows about, manipulating public opinion. And then he would send the president out, and all of a sudden public opinion would switch. Jim Baker, in his memoirs, says something 
not crowing, but s similar. Now, I, I'm a, a great fan of Jim Baker. I think he's a great American. He's done many good things for America. They're all completely wrong. It never happened. Ronald Reagan basically never moved the public opinion on any issue in his direction. The evidence is overwhelming. Uh, it's, all, it's all been published. It's, it's, it's all very clear. It just didn't happen. It didn't happen on, on uh, defense spending. It didn't happen on government spending. It didn't happen <coughs> on uh, Iran-Contra. Let me read from Ronald Reagan's memoirs. Time and again, I would speak on television to a joint session of Congress and to other audiences about the problems in Central America. And I would hope that the outcome would be an outpouring of support from Americans who would apply the same kind of heat on Congress that helped pass the economic recovery package. But the polls usually found that large numbers of Americans cared little or not at all about what happened in Central America. In fact, a surprisingly large proportion didn't even know where Nicaragua and El Salvador were located. And among those who did care, too few cared enough about a communist penetration of the Americas to apply the kind of pressure I needed on Congress. That is the typical situation. It's not his fault. It's not a criticism, because that's the same situation that all presidents face. And all you have to do is look at our current president, who is also a great communicator, a great writer, and has a very difficult time moving public opinion, as we all know. It was true of FDR. It was true of JFK. You take, you take your pick. So the president was not able was not able to move the public in his direction. On Iran Contra, when he was in a defensive position, he made four nationally televised addresses. Basically, public opinion didn't move at all. It's quite fascinating, <coughs> but it, it didn't move at all. Marlon Fitzwater put it this way. Reagan would go out on the stump, draw huge throngs, and convert no one at all. A great communicator, perhaps, a great writer, perhaps, but the fact is, that his presidency, in terms of the, the bully pulpit, was just like everybody else's. He couldn't move the public. Was he a popular president? Not particularly. His average approval rating, and I published every one of these, so you can look at them, with the demographic breakdowns, was 52%. Not bad, could be worse. Not as good as Bill Clinton. Not as good as H George H.W. Bush, but it could have been worse. At any rate, <laughs> it tells us something, something about it. And we had from Dan earlier, when did his, uh, it, by November of his first year, he was below 50% in the polls. It's not surprising because we were having some bad economic times. He didn't get back up above 50% until the latter part of 1983. Then he got really high in 65, excuse me, 85 and 86. Iran Contra came, there was a big drop, and until the last two polls, which were lovely for him, in the last two polls, he was down there 49 percent, and that's why the average was 52 percent. Moreover, he was a highly polarizing president. That's not necessarily bad, but the difference between Democrats and Republicans was greater than it had been for any previous president for which we had data at the time. Now, that polarization is nothing compared to today's polarization. <laughs> it was like a love fest, but we should not, we should not ignore, we should not ignore what actually happened in the real world. But here's the good news now. So you can't create opportunities, and I've given you one example taken uh, from what should have been his strongest suit about the bully pulpit. So you can't create opportunities, but you can't exploit them. And they were very, very good at that. Ronald Reagan was uh, a best test uh, example. I have, for years, when it looked like there had to be a, a switch in president, written for various good government organizations, transition studies. And, and, and we always tell them to do certain kinds of things, and sometimes they pay attention and sometimes they don't, like be ready to move rapidly, have a narrow agenda, you know, focus, move. Ronald Reagan did that exactly, and I'll say a little bit more in, in just a minute. Not all presidents do that. Think of Bill Clinton, think of Jimmy Carter. It, you know, they didn't, they didn't follow our advice. Now, they may not, the Reagan administration didn't necessarily need our advice, but they were grown-ups, so they knew what to do. And that's, uh, I think, that uh, there's a lot, to be, a lot to be said for it. And they also knew that they couldn't create opportunities. <clears throat> and that's part of the beauty of this as well. Uh, so let me say something about, oh, first I want to say one thing, one more thing, excuse me, a nice example about exploiting an opportunity through the bully pulpit. 
1985, uh, Ronald Reagan asked Congress to appropriate funds for 21 additional MX missiles. But he was having a very difficult time uh, getting the money. He, had, he asked for the same missiles in 1984. And the debate focused on the utility of these strategic missiles. What can you blow up for how much money, et cetera. And he didn't get the money. So he came back the next year. And what he did is reframe the debate. Now remember, the missiles were exactly the same. They cost the same money and had the same capabilities. The missiles hadn't changed. But what he said is, you know what this, these are for now? These are a bargaining chip in Geneva. He reframed the debate. Now, presidents always try to reframe debates. They like to do that, and they almost always fail. But here's an example where it worked. He exploited an opportunity, and he did it, did it uh, brilliantly. In 1981, he had an opportunity, <clears throat> an unexpectedly large victory, as we've heard already. It was very close, actually, with Jimmy Carter until that debate. And after the debate, it started pulling away. But nevertheless, the storyline had been a close election for months, up to, right, up to, uh, right up to the election. It was also bad times, as you may recall. Stagflation. We had an, e an economy that some people said was impossible, both inflation and high unemployment. <clears throat> At any rate, <clears throat> we'd had challenges abroad. And the president wanted to, uh, wanted to, of course, increase defense spending. Now, <clears throat> so he had a lot of advantages going, in, going into this. David Stockman, you recall David Stockman, I'm sure, said uh, that when the president announced his program for economic recovery in February of 81, <clears throat> the plan already had momentum and few were standing in the way. Reagan was speaking to an assembly of desperate politicians who were predisposed to grant him extraordinary latitude defining a new remedy for the nation's ills. Not because they understood the plan or even accepted it, but because they'd lost faith in all the remedies tried before. Paul Craig Roberts, one of his principal economic advisors, said by the time Ronald Reagan entered the White House, only an incompetent administration could have lost the tax cut battle. I'm not sure that's true. I'm way more on Matt's side. But the real point is the administration exploited these opportunities to get its historic legislation through, and they did it. They were ready to move, and they did it. And they moved rapidly and effectively. Uh, one of the things that they recognized, and there is a memo that uh, Richard Worthlin, Ed Meese, and David Gergen wrote. It's somewhere in the Reagan Library. I have a copy of it because Richard Worthlin gave it to me many years ago which says, we have a narrow window of opportunity. We know we can't create opportunities. We know times are going to be bad soon. So we have to focus on our high priorities, and we got, we, we got to have a very narrow agenda. And they, and they had very good discipline to, to uh, <coughs> carry out, to execute that plan. So they wouldn't let members of the White House staff go on the Sunday talk shows and talk about other things. Social conservatives, a little upset, but nevertheless, they wouldn't back off. They wouldn't back off, they wouldn't back off. They tried to have just a few votes. Mac Friedersdorf, the head of the uh, legislative liaison office, said in 81, during the whole course of the year, we had only three major votes. But that isn't, that isn't a criticism, <laughs> that's a compliment. <laughs> because those are three really big votes. That's how you get things through, that's how you exploit an opportunity. When you've got limited capital, as Matt has shown you, that's exactly what they do. When the president was shot, and I know it's perverse to say, but getting shot didn't hurt. Uh, uh, physically it hurt, but it didn't hurt the, the, uh, the, the legislative agenda. Within a week, Michael Deaver had convened a meeting of high-level officials at the White House to say, how can we exploit this opportunity? And when the president came back and spoke on national TV, it was extremely effective. It was extremely effective because of the circumstances. So. <clears throat> The president was, was they, they, they particularly had success by understanding, by being grown-ups, by understanding what the real world was, what the real opportunity structure was, how, what they could do and couldn't do by not overloading the system and getting nothing, not, and, and by being ready to go. So they were very good. I mean, they, 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 they followed what we recommend, and I, I think it's, it's a model of how you exploit opportunities in a world where you can't create opportunities. Thank you.
Well, we'll see. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> I didn't pay for this microphone, but, <laughs> but I'll try to use it anyway. <laughs> I, I want to start, if, if you'll indulge me for just a minute, to add my own thanks for the inf inf invitation to participate in this symposium. I very much value the opportunity to learn from those who knew and worked with President Reagan. In my own work on presidential staffing across several presidents, I've come to very much value presidential libraries, but also interviewing and reading oral histories of and looking at the memos and papers of all of those who work with and for presidencies. It's an enormous asset for those of us trying to make sense of what did happen and what we can learn from the activities of these people. And I very much appreciate the opportunity to be here. Of course, I always value what I learned from my many colleagues at the Annenberg School, from SPPD, and of course others all around the country. So again, thank you very much. As, as Matt drew our attention to, clearly legislation and presidents working with Congress are very important sources of policy performance, of policy achievement, and sometimes constraints on what it is government can do and cannot do. Clearly that's the case in the Reagan presidency as well. Through legislation, as in many other ways, the Reagan administration shaped policy in numerous areas that we've heard about over the last several days from civil rights to tax policy to national security policy to job training and welfare reform policy as well. At the same time, as the first session this morning reminded us, there are other avenues for policy achievements and legacies as well. Clearly, rhetoric is one of the important avenues that many presidents, especially gifted presidents like President Reagan, are able to use to convey, to shape, to communicate policy content and policy substance. And I think that's important to keep in mind as well when we talk about policy legacies. What I'd like to do briefly is to turn to another avenue of, of policy contribution and of policy impact. That is, regardless of the scope or the extent of Reagan's legislative successes, many of the other items on his policy agenda, including priorities in areas like civil rights, natural resources, and environmental policy, were pursued in ways that I want to touch on here under the rubric of what's been called the administrative presidency. Now this term is a term that was given to efforts by Nixon and then later Reagan by former Nixon and Reagan staffer Richard Nathan. For him, what the administrative presidency referred to was the pursuit of presidential policy goals through activities involving executive branch personnel, budgeting, rulemaking and application, and a host of other strategies. Strategy is a word that keeps being used and with good reason over the last, last couple of days. One of the things that sets the Reagan administration apart from some other administrations is its careful efforts to, with clear policy priorities and values in a range of areas, to design and then to try to execute strategies to pursue those priorities. I want to argue briefly that much the same thing happened in presidential pursuit of policy initiatives and values within the executive branch bureaucracy, not just in dealing with Congress. Richard Nixon, as many of you know, is the president that really is credited with pioneering reliance on these so-called administrative strategies. The possible influence of those tools in his administration, of course, never fully played out as his presidency coped with the fallout from the abuses we collectively call Watergate. It's the Reagan administration then that from the start explicitly and strategically applied administrative tools. Now that's not as celebrated and certainly not as sexy, if you will, a set of ideas to come up with, but I think it's a key and lasting part of the Reagan legacy, the use of these administrative kinds of tools. Now many of Ronald Reagan's administrative strategies can be seen as part of the pursuit of this larger agenda. In domestic and economic policy, we can call it with Charles Joan a contractive agenda of reigning in a government that in the president's terms overspent, overestimated, and overregulated. His goals then in attempting to make government better, as we heard earlier today, revolved around deregulation, defunding, and devolution. Administrative presidency strategies encompass a variety of power tools. I'd like to focus just very briefly on three of those. Personnel, budgeting, 
and regulation, or in the case here, deregulation. Personnel is policy. We've heard that for a very long time. And White House officials recognize that in order to get control of policy, one needs those who are loyal to the president, but also qualified for the job. In the Reagan administration, the transition into the presidency focused first on what Pendleton James, the head of the Office of Presidential Personnel, called the key 87 positions. Those key positions included executive posts necessary for the implementation of Ronald Reagan's economic policies. Now, Reagan's strategies included both political appointees, which Jim Fifner talked, talked to us about yesterday, but also focused on civil servants and career officials throughout the, the executive branch. President Reagan was able to fill, as Jim reminded us yesterday, almost 8,000 executive branch positions when he took office, from cabinet secretaries to those throughout the executive branch agencies. I'd want to add, along with those appointments, that we also need to remember that by the time Reagan left office, he also had appointed over half of the federal judiciary. That included 78 appeals court judges as well as 298 U.S. District Court judges. These federal judges also have an impact on interpreting and, in some people's views, shaping policy as well. We were reminded of that just a couple of days ago when the U.S. District Court judge in Florida who declared the health care legislation for the most part unconstitutional was a judge named Roger Vinson. Who appointed Roger Vinson? Ronald Reagan. Those Reagan judges remain on the federal courts and they too have some significant impacts, arguably, on the policy that is pursued or is not pursued at many levels of government. Now, the systematic selection of both judges and also of executive branch officials who shared the president's priorities aimed at bringing about greater congruence with presidential goals by placing appointees who shared those goals in key positions. In effect, allowing the president's DNA, if you will, to permeate decision making at multiple levels in varying locations. Now, this was often the case in, say, some of the regulatory agencies. Think of a few examples of this counter-staffing, if you will, within the regulatory agencies. James Watt, as Secretary of Interior, coming from the Mountain States Legal Foundation with a clear commitment to deregulating many areas of Western land use. James Harris, many of you may remember, was the Director of the Office of Surface Mining. As an Indiana Senator, some may remember, Harris had called for state challenges to the very constitutionality of federal strip mining legislation. William Bradford Reynolds, to move away from natural resources and, and environmental policy, was in the Civil Rights Division in the Justice Department. He guided changes in remedies sought in employment discrimination, moving away from affirmative action quotas and timelines to other remedies, and also in school desegregation, moving away from busing. Now, that's not always very visible, though in some, some of those instances it was, but it did not involve Congress. It did not involve public rhetoric. What it involved were actions taken by executive branch departments and agencies at various places around the country and in federal courts and elsewhere. Now, these appointees were selected for the congruence with presidential values and presidential priorities. More than that, the administration took very seriously the notion to make sure that these folks knew they were working with the president and for the president. What he didn't want these folks to do is to go out and, in John Ehrlichman's memorable terms, marry the natives in the department. They were brought to the White House on a regular basis, both sub-cabinet appointees and cabinet appointees, to work together in cabinet councils, in sub-councils, in and around the White House, to build ties across these people as they pursued presidential goals out in the broad-ranging executive branch landscape. At the same time, these appointees, of course, were significantly outnumbered by all of the career officials in the executive branch departments. Now, many Reagan officials had deep-seated suspicions of these civil servants, especially those in agencies that they perceived to be liberal health and human services, housing and urban development, units with regulatory responsibilities in OSHA and the Environmental Protection Agency. That apparent antipathy, I think it's important to recall, was visible in some ways almost immediately. Soon after being inaugurated, 
The President issued a federal hiring freeze. Training sessions conducted by the Heritage Foundation to familiarize new appointees with executive branch agencies cautioned about working with, quote, a presumptively recalcitrant <laughs> bureaucracy. Now, another frequent tactic to enhance congruence with administration priorities was the selective use of reductions in forces, the so-called RIFs, that were selectively targeted, not done across the board, not doing across the board freezes, as we saw in later administrations, but selecting where in executive branch agencies and departments, consistent with Reagan priorities, there needed to be reorientations, reguiding and reshifting of what was being done. In the first three years of the Reagan administration, 92,000 federal appointees, were, or federal employees rather, were involved in reductions in forces. That's related to a second tool of the administrative presidency, the use of the budget. The Office of Management and Budget increased its influence over agency budget requests, seeking to assure that funds and activities were consistent, again, with presidential priorities. Again, the word strategic occurs. Strategic budget cuts were made across the regulatory agencies. One of the goals, of course, was deregulation, and that was consistently pursued across the administration. That included agencies like EPA, which Jim is going to talk about, like OSHA, like the Securities and Exchange Commission. Under Director Ann Gorsuch Burford of the Environmental Protection Agency, for example, EPA experienced inflation-adjusted budget cuts of 50 percent, 23 percent, and 33 percent, respectively, in EPA's research, state grants, and operating budgets. <laughs> Final, finally, very quickly, the Reagan transition team and the Reagan administration looked very carefully at regulation and deregulation. The unfortunate impact of that, at least according to Lou Cannon, very quickly, was that Ronald Reagan left a ruinous regulatory legacy. Cannon argues, we might recall, that deregulation of oil prices led to the waste of irreplaceable oil resources, the early laxity of regulatory enforcement at EPA increased the hazardous waste problem, and relaxation of regulatory restraints on thrift institutions contributed to the savings and loan scandal. I don't want to engage in those arguments. What I do want to emphasize, however, is that as important as legislation is, as important as rhetoric is, that President's efforts to influence policy during the Reagan administration clearly has to take into account what was going on in the executive branch agencies themselves. Thanks. Thanks, Karen. I'm, I'm going to uh, try to build on what Karen had to say by talking about two cases. I'm also going to be focusing on the administrative presidency because uh, uh, I'm not a political scientist. Uh, my area is public administration. Um, although I think the point that Karen makes is that, and that Richard Nathan brought to us originally, and that is that uh, presidents and uh, their appointees do make a big difference or can make a big difference with respect to uh, public policy and leading public policy and directing public policy through the admi ad administrative mechanisms uh, that Karen mentioned in, in sort of three broad frames, personnel, budgeting, and regulation. Uh, the two cases I want to talk about uh, briefly, one is the uh, uh, Professional Air Traffic Controllers Organization and its strike against the uh, Federal Aviation Administration, and then the other is the appointment of Ann Gorsuch as the uh, administrator of EPA uh, and what subsequently uh, transpired at, at EPA, at least in broad terms. So lo let me start with uh, uh, the Professional Air Traffic Controllers, and I see about a third of our audience uh, was probably born after this episode, um, and that's probably why Jack has me here, because I was born well before this episode. Um, but uh, I'm going to use the shorthand PATCO, uh, which was the, the, the name that became prominent. But le let me sort of put a, provide a little bit of context, uh, because I think it also uh, tends or helps to convey the significance of what happened surrounding the PATCO uh, strike. Uh, I did my dissertation on public sector labor relations. I went to New York City in 1970, or wrote a dissertation in 1974. Uh, during that era, particularly the late 1960s, 1970s, public sector unionism uh, was a major administrative development, major, major development across cities, 
states and the federal government. Uh, uh, and there was generally, if you look at all the literature that was written, a strong fear of public sector labor organizations. Certainly there are mayors, Mayor Lindsay in New York and others, uh, who probably lo ultimately lost their positions uh, because of the power of the unions and the ability of the unions to put uh, mayors and, and other public leaders in difficult positions. So I think it's important to understand that context uh, of the 1970s when thinking about PATCO. Uh, in February 1981, fairly early in the Reagan administration, uh, PATCO opened negotiations with the Federal Aviation Administration. Now, uh, we're talking about air traffic controllers, stressful jobs, and clearly one of the things they brought to the table, or some of the things they brought to the table was, we want a shorter work week. Uh, this is stressful work. We want the ability to be able to focus on that work. Uh, we'd also like, uh, uh, in addition to that, a $10,000 wage increase. Uh, and then finally, they also wanted uh, a sweetening of their benefits and retirement package. Uh, that was in February 1981. They were not able to come to any resolution, so on uh, August 3rd, 1981, 12,000 air traffic controllers struck uh, after P uh, PATCO failed to reach an agreement with the Federal Aviation Administration. Now, Ronald Reagan's response was relatively simple and straightforward. Uh, he uh, uh, issued a statement saying, the controllers are in violation of the law, and if they don't return to work in 48 hours, they will forfeit their jobs. Now, that, uh, that is a threat uh, that no mayor made when his or her police force or fire departments went out, uh, or no uh, mayor uh, made when the sanitation workers went out, but Ronald Reagan stepped up and with what, at least from a distance, we would perceive as a fairly technical job, that is air traffic controllers, and an important job for, for public health and safety, uh, he said, if you leave and don't come back, uh, you've lost your job, you're gonna forfeit your job. Uh, now, the, one of the, I think, sort of the amazing things is, could Reagan, in a matter of 48 hours, assemble sufficient uh, air traffic controllers and people to keep the system together, uh, much less uh, follow through with his threat? And of course, the answer to that was that on August 5th, 1981, 1981 Reagan fired 12,000 controllers for failing uh, to return to work. So he followed through directly on his threat to the air traffic controllers uh, was able to draw in people, including military controllers, uh, to fulfill uh, the needs of the air traffic control system. And he also outlawed these people from, be from coming back to federal employment for, li for their lifetimes. Now that, there was a, a ultimately amnesty, but certainly uh, it, was, it was sort of harsh treatment, but a treatment consistent with the law. So we might ask ourselves, what, what's the aftermath of that effort administratively to take action, although action certainly within the law, uh, to tell controllers, if you're not gonna work, you've lost your jobs. Uh, one of the things I did in preparing was I went back and tried to sort of look at sort of the historical assessment. Uh, <coughs> one of the sources I found, somebody said I shouldn't mention this, but uh, NPR, uh, but somebody mentioned, uh, they said this is too liberal for a group talking about the <laughs> Reagan presidency, but, uh, uh, certainly, we mentioned New York Times yesterday, so I think I can mention NPR, but in, in a 25th uh, anniversary story, they called the uh, firing of the air traffic controllers a pivotal event in American economic history. Uh, it wasn't merely stepping forward and firing the controllers and replacing them. Uh, the NPR statement, as well as a, uh, an assessment by Georgetown uh, professor, uh, historian uh, Joseph McCartan, uh, said that this is a pivotal event in American economic history. Uh, now, the question is sort of why do they sort of categorize it with in such uh, grand terms? One of the things certainly the Reagan administration began doing through the administrative presidency was appointing different types of people to the National Labor Relations Board uh, and uh, in effect uh, changing the, the interpretation, making it a more empl uh, employer uh, responsive interpretation uh, of the nation's labor laws. Uh, symbolically though, the firing of the air traffic controllers had the consequence 
of basically saying uh, it's okay to fire people who strike and you can replace them. Now prior to that there was a reluctance to take such firm action on the part of employers. A couple of economists did a study of the consequences of this action for, uh, uh, for wages in the ensuing decade and found that it had even a dampening effect on the growth of union wage rates over the course of the next decade. So when NPR and historians say this is a, 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 a development of a pivotal event in American economic history, uh, they really are sort of connecting with a variety of things that changed during the Reagan administration as part of the as the in trying to exercise the administrative presidency. Um, the path of labor management relations in this country, I think, have been permanently affected, uh, in part being traced back to this uh, action against the PATCO strike uh, in 1981. What's also interesting, though, and somewhat ironic, is that the consequences have been far less, I think, in the public sector. And although PATCO was a public example in the federal government, uh, many of the consequences traced to the PATCO developments uh, occurred in the private sector subsequent to the firing of the air traffic controllers. Now, let me turn to the, quickly to the second case. Ann Gorsuch uh, as the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency. Gorsuch was nominated in the same month that the PATCO strike uh, took place, February 1981, beco to become EPA administrator. Uh, she certainly, as, um, as Karen indicated, was an adherent of the pre President's budget cutting and regulatory relief goals, uh, but her credentials to fulfill this job as administrator of EPA uh, were pretty modest. She was a former assistant district attorney in Denver. She spent four years immediately prior to taking on uh, her administrative uh, role at EPA uh, as a Republican member of the Colorado House of Representatives. She had no experience managing uh, large environmental organizations or public health programs. Uh, and relatively little experience managing uh, organizations in general. She was confirmed by a voice vote on March 5, 1981. Now, what were the consequences of Gorsuch's appointment? And again, turn back to Karen's uh, categories of, uh, of uh, regulation, budgeting, and personnel. But let me start with one, and that is uh, that Karen also mentioned, reorganization. She reorganized EPA in June 1981 uh, she appointed two new associate administrators who were not pol uh, Senate confirmed political appointees, uh, but they were the folks to whom uh, the assistant administrators reported as a way, of, in effect, of controlling the decision making process uh, in EPA. One of our uh, colleagues uh, in the public affairs business, Al Zuck, came in later and said that uh, uh, raised some real questions about uh, the uh, wisdom of that organizational structure uh, and whether it was a real organizational structure or organizational chaos. In fiscal year 1981, again going to the personnel issue, 4,129 careerists uh, left EPA. That's out of a staff of about 15,000. 236 were rift. Um, as of 1983, uh, only five of the 1,419 national priority Superfund sites have been cleaned up. Superfund was created and uh, uh, legislation passed in 1980 at the end of the Carter administration. Now, what ultimately uh, undid Gorsuch uh, and, and her team at EPA was the Superfund uh, initiative and congressional investigations of the implementation of Superfund. And again, this raises some questions about what are the limits to the administrative presidency. Karen mentioned, for instance, Richard Nixon and Nixon's effort to impound congressionally appropriated funds of which ultimately uh, Congress took action uh, to assure that there were no impoundments. But uh, this, in effect, amounted to an impoundment uh, and certainly raised issues uh, in the media but also among the public about the President's willingness to push forward on this. Gorsuch was uh, 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 charged with contempt of Congress uh, and on March 9, 1983, President Reagan reluctantly accepted Gorsuch's resignation. Now, just like the Patco case where we have an aftermath, what's the aftermath of the appointment of uh, Gorsuch as, as administrator and her subsequent uh, resignation? Uh, on March 
1983, President Reagan nominated Williams Ruckelshaus, William Ruckelshaus as EPA administrator. Ruckelshaus was the founding administrator of EPA, brought a record of serious environmental stewardship from his previous service, and a reputation for integrity associated with his refusal to uh, fire uh, Archibald Cox as special prosecutor uh, uh, at the direction of, the, of President Nixon. Uh, Ruckelshaus negotiated uh, a high degree of independence in his performance as the EPA administrator because in part uh, what he was concerned about was whether or not he would become mired in the same process that Gorsuch found herself. To some extent, uh, to her credit, uh, she was in, uh, uh, and, and I think George mentioned, uh, or George or Karen mentioned, uh, David Stockman. Clearly, this all took place in the context sort of a larger uh, direction from the administration about deregulation uh, and regulatory relief and also budget cutting. Uh, uh, but Ruckelshaus was clearly in a position where uh, he didn't want to go down that path because it was a no win path for him to take over this role uh, and not to be able to undo the difficulties. Uh, created by the, uh, during the Gorsuch uh, regime. The bottom line was that uh, the direction of the president was to keep EPA off the front page of the Washington Post, uh, which is sort of a common criterion for whether or not you're an effective administrator in Washington. Uh, the result was it wasn't too long before not only uh, Ruckelshaus was able to take EPA off the front page, but also uh, to take them out of the newspaper entirely. Uh, that is, he was able uh, successfully uh, to restore uh, some of the credibility by also restoring some of the budget and the enforcement activities of the EPA, which in effect undid much of the intent of the Reagan administration uh, to sort of reduce the regulatory burden on, uh, or, uh, on uh, economic organizations and on the economy. So. What we have uh, is perhaps the opposite result of the PATCO uh, situation. That is, that by trying to exercise the administrative presidency and the admi use the administrative mechanisms, uh, the Reagan administration fell far short uh, of its broader goals for regulatory relief and budget cutting. Um, I think these two cases are consistent, although we probably ought to discuss this, uh, with the argument about context. That is. Uh, that context is important. I think the public in each one of these cases ultimately determine whether an administrative strategy works by virtue of their support or lack of support uh, for the administrative uh, strategy. Um, I think it also sends a favorable message about sort of our administrative apparatus that uh, we were able to pursue given the transparency and perhaps the accountability of our administrative structures undo that which may have gone beyond the boundaries of what was acceptable uh, through the administrative apparatus to change decisions that have been made by Congress uh, and through the legislative branch. Uh, I also think uh, at least the PATCO uh, effort uh, demonstrated the power of political symbolism because what happened as a result of PATCO was largely in the private sector uh, and emboldened, for instance, private executives to take on unions in ways that it, they had not been emboldened previously, but consistent with the Reagan administration intent, uh, and that was to favor employers uh, over the labor unions uh, as a way of sort of restoring uh, economic activity and supporting uh, economic activity uh, throughout America. Thank you, Jim. Uh, we're running. I think this is a complicated question as to exactly what 
that, that's part of the irony, yeah, though. Because, yeah, uh, yeah. It, it didn't seem to uh, have much of an impact on uh, the, the strength or, or weakening of public unions at all. In fact, they seem the strongest ever, uh, certainly at state and local level. But uh, I've been involved now in trying to change the hiring practice for students in the federal government. And the uh, public unions uh, are basically the main opposition that we face in trying to get students internships in the, in the federal government. So uh, it's, I, I think that's a complicated issue. Given the time, uh, I think I'm going to open it up. And uh, we'll, do we have a microphone that we can pay a chat? It's going to have the first question. I wanted to ask the panel to elaborate further on what Karen and Kim were noting, that is the reliance of President Reagan on the institutional presidency. Uh, I observed that he had the confidence in the and certainly the humility to rely heavily on the institutional presidency. I'll pick up on your comment, Karen. The cabinet council became a device whereby the president and the administration relied very heavily from the beginning on those of us who were in the career service. Yes. So for example, I was the one who advised Fred Fielding, the attorney, and Ed Meese on PATCO and how to deal with the transportation department in that strike. And I advised them to fire them. Not only to fire them, but immediately. In short, before the next payroll came along so that they couldn't meet their bills and their mortgage, the new mortgage baby, and so on. And it wasn't simply on that, but on the issues across the board. Largely because of the leadership of Ralph Blitzel, who was the facilitator of the principal cabinet council. But then one other area that I think needs elaboration is the impact of Ed Meese's advice to the presidency that led to the growth of presidential signing statements on legislation and all of that, the sort of thing that Jim Fisker has written about considerably. So might we hear a little bit more about uh, President Reagan and the institutional presidency? He showed the humility to rely upon that as much as any president I have observed. I, I think, I, think I, I absolutely agree with you. I had thought about talking about a little bit of the prehistory before one goes to Congress with legislative proposals from the president. And that, to me, is one of the places where those cabinet councils were very important, especially with working with White House staffers in developing appropriate legislative initiatives to send to Congress that really were the president's initiatives pursuing presidential priorities, at least my understanding of how the cabinet councils and the Office of Policy Development and so forth worked in and around the presidency. Those were absolutely vital in part of that process. I think that's, I think that's very important in so many ways. Um, and I'd love to talk with you later about how all of those dynamics worked because that's one thing that though it didn't start in the Reagan presidency, I think you can trace it at least back to Richard Nixon, it certainly was done systematically and I think quite appropriately in the first term where there were those multitude of cabinet councils that brought members of the cabinet together to work together on cross-jurisdictional issues, but they were guided by Ralph Bledsoe and other members of the White House staff. And I think that joining of the two together was really a fruitful opportunity to, to move policy along in, in, in a variety of areas. On the signing statements, very briefly, I think that what Ed Meese was able to do as Attorney General, he was the one that, not to get too arcane about this, but the convinced West law to add presidential signing statement language into the legislative history portion of what, of what got published by West law that's available to a variety of judges, but also, I think at least as importantly, to administrators within the executive branch that conveyed the president's interpretation of the law that the president and the White House staff wanted to guide administrative officials as they implemented the legislation. My view, I agree with, with my colleague Chris Kelly, is that it wasn't so much to influence judges, but it was to influence administrators in the executive branch. But the signing statements are very important. Take another one. We do another. Yeah, I just wanted to add one thing to this, and that, and that's a 
the motivations around these are similar, and they have to do with trying to reduce government uh, intrusions and restrictions and cartel like structures uh, to keep the economy going. Uh, and this came out of, I think, the stagflation debate in the 1970s, where uh, a lot of economic research showed that the regulate a lot of the regulations the government was involved with during that period were uh, uh, both causing inflation by uh, artificially raising prices and slowing productivity uh, and contributed to stagflation. So it, that's that context within which 